o'clock at night Methodist Church. We are glad you are here in worship and put this this morning where you are invited to come, connect, grow, and serve. It is your road map to a meaningful purpose. We want to remind you this morning that you are welcome here, no matter where you have come from, no matter where you are going, no matter what you believe or doubt, no matter what you have or don't have, and no matter whom you love. All of you is welcome into this time of worship by a God who loves you and knows you by name and wants a personal relationship with you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. Uh, announcements this week. So um, I, I understand that the um, prayer parade um, did a really, that was re really awesome on, on Wednesday night and that there were a good many people, not so many from Clough, but from from the other churches and they went to the schools and prayed and then it was a really, really awesome event. The cards of blessing and the the, um, the supplies for the um, prayer baskets um, were due today, but that wasn't communicated very well. So Donna said, if you um, meant to do that and haven't, if you go out this afternoon and get some things and drop them off here to the church, um, she will get them and deliver them tomorrow. Um, so today is the day of our, um, 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 what we used to call backpack blessing, and, um, and we don't even have any kids in service today, so that's, I'm sad, but, <clears throat> but I'm sure you back, blessed some backpacks at Cherry Grove. Did you got, do that? Well, at, at Cherry Grove, we, um, we'll, I'll do it later. Uh -huh. We'll just lift it up names. Okay, super. Well, there you go. How do you want to get the names? Because we do have some children here. They're just right here. During worship. During worship. Okay. All right, super. All right. <clears throat> um, we are um, now collecting food for the Summerside Elementary students who need food for the, um, for the weekends. Uh, we do 35 food bags um, a week and um, they need donations of individually packaged food with e easy open tops, and they are being accepted, and you can place them in the, um, in the grocery, grocery basket out there in the lobby, or you can call Courtney if you are, are buying some cases of stuff, and I know some of you do that. Um, she will make, make arrangements with you to get those from you. Um, Jack's Closet is um, accepting donations of school supplies, backpacks, our school supplies and backpacks are really, um, the backpacks are all right, but the school supplies are getting really low. So if you're out and about, I mean, crayons are 25 cents a box so for 24 and some really good prices. If you could pick up some school supplies for us, we'd, we'd appreciate it. And as always, we're um, um, accepting children's clothing, premium through 18, 20 sizes, youth sizes, not adult sizes. All right, let's take a quiet moment and center for the service. <clears throat> Seek the living God who rescues and saves us in time of trial. Seek the living God who renews, transforms, and strengthen us, strengthens us in our hour of need. Please stand for our opening song.
Will you pray with me? Maker of heaven and earth, we come from different places with our own places on the journey. Some of us have succeeded and found favor. Some of us have failed and seek reassurance. Some of us feel trapped and helpless. Some of us have escaped peril and feel great relief. But no matter what our experience has been, we come here today to meet you in worship. Remind us of your power and mercy. Replenish our courage and vision. Renew our identity as your people. Reinvigorate our holy work in this world. For our help is in your name alone, holy God, maker of heaven and earth. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, this is a little embarrassing. I'm supposed to read the scripture, aren't I? You read this. Okay. I apologize. <laughs> the scripture this morning is from <clears throat> the scripture this morning is from Exodus one eight through twenty two. Israel is oppressed. Now a new king came to power in Egypt who didn't know Joseph. He said to his people. The Israelite people are now larger in number and stronger than we are. Come on and be smart and deal with them. Otherwise, they will only grow in number. And if the war breaks out, they will join our enemies, fight against us, and then escape the land. As a result, the Egyptians put foremen of forced work gangs over the Israelites to harass them with hard work. They had to build storage cities named Pithom and, and Ramses for the Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they grew and spread, so much that the Egyptians started to look at the Israelites with disgust and dread. So the Egyptians enslaved the Israelites. They made their lives miserable with hard labor, making mortar and bricks, doing field work, and by forcing them to do all kinds of other cruel work. The king of Egypt spoke to two Hebrew midwives named Shifra and Hua. When you are helping the Hebrew women give birth, and you see the baby being born, if it's a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, you can let her live. Now the two midwives respected God, so they didn't obey the Egyptian king's order. Instead, they let the baby boys live. So the king of Egypt called the two midwives and said to them, why are you doing this? To why are you letting the baby boys live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because Hebrew women aren't like Egyptian women. They are much stronger and give birth before any midwives can get to them. So God treated the midwives well, and the people kept on multiplying and became strong, very strong. And because the midwives respected God, God gave them households of their own. Then Pharaoh gave, gave an order to all his people, throw every be born to the Hebrews into the Nile River, but you can let all the girls live. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you please join us in the heart of worship?
have you guys' skills on the keyboards. Thank you. Well, it is a joy to be back in worship with you all. It feels so long between times we're going to see each other, but know that you continue to be in my, in my thoughts and prayers and my, my, uh, my thinking about ministry and how we can continue to do life together. So thank you, and welcome to worship. Um, as, we, uh, as I think about this past week, I wanted to celebrate the prayer parade that happened. So thank you to those who came out, um, and those of you who might have done the prayer parade on your own schedule. Um, anything that you do to lift up the schools and the teachers and the staff and the parents right now is much appreciated. Much appreciated. Because it's a stressful time. Amen? So if you haven't had the opportunity, please do take some cards, bring them back, um, get, them, get them to um, Donna, <laughs> sorry, um, to, to make sure that we can get those out. Tomorrow she's going to be taking baskets on behalf of Clough and Cherry Grove to each of the 10 schools, 9 in Milford plus Well, Forest Hills and Summerside. There we go. I apologize. My brain's not working too fast this morning. <laughs> One of the things that delighted my son and I, my children and I, was that, uh, that Donna had on her car attached balloons, a, a set of three balloons to each side of, of her big van. And as we pulled up behind her on the road and she started picking up speed, man, those, those balloons just rattled against each other so fast. I was afraid that they were going to pop or, or blow away immediately. And they might have eventually, but not on the way to that first school. They, they stayed attached. It's amazing how our, our lives can be so humdrum, so, so everyday and ordinary, and yet the smallest thing that stands out, something as simple as adding balloons to your car, can make a difference. It's crazy how it can make us, make us smile. So thank you to everyone who has made that effort to, to tangibly and publicly offer prayers for our schools. Will you pray with me? Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be guided fully by your Holy Spirit. May anything that is from us quickly fade away, and may the messages of your word and Holy Spirit stick in us until they transform us more closely into the image of your Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I read today's scripture, I, I couldn't help but thinking about the overwhelming pressures faced by the two midwives in the story. They grew up in a culture, in a society that said that they deserved to be slaves, that they were less than the Egyptians, and that the Egyptians were superior. They were taught to believe that the Jewish people were a threat and that they, the Pharaoh's word was ultimate. We might call of the, these things implicit biases. Perhaps you've heard that term. Uh, the leadership here at Clough has been studying implicit bias over the last several months. It's this idea that whether we know it or not, we grew up in a, a soup of biases that we kind of unconsciously absorbed. We don't know that we have them, but we do. And there's little psychology tests that can show you know, your, your implicit biases, and it's not it's not just people with privilege having biases against those without. People without privilege or, or, or having the biases can have the same bias against each other. So women can have biases against other women, right? Minorities can have biases against their own minorities. It's not conscious. It's not logical. It's just the air we breathe unconsciously. It's easy to look back on the Egyptian society in Exodus and see all of the obvious problems there with hierarchy and slavery and such. But sometimes it's harder to look at our own. 
It's harder to see our own biases and it's harder to see our own world's problems. Sometimes the problems we face are obvious, like how to educate during a pandemic, right? But sometimes they, these problems might seem obvious to some and, and not to others, like maybe police violence and systemic racism that we're having this, these conversations about. And most times, these problems seem so huge and overwhelming, so contentious, that it seems like there's nothing we can do about it. It's overwhelming. Maybe we think about poverty or homelessness or, or global warming. It's easy and tempting to look at these problems and just shake our head and go back to business as usual. Just keep going. Yet these two midwives, they have chosen to listen to something different. To see this conflict that they are in and to refuse to play the role that was dealt to them in life. They knew that the Pharaoh's word was final. They knew the consequences of disobeying the Pharaoh. And yet they also believed, they also learned about the power of Yahweh. They'd seen it firsthand in the miraculous multiplication of the Jewish people, continued blessings in a land of oppression. And so when confronted by this order from the Pharaoh that put them squarely between a rock and a hard place, between the power of the Pharaoh and the power of Yahweh, they cannot put their heads in the sand. They cannot just go back to business as usual. They cannot convince themselves to just follow orders and play the part the world had them in. And so they chose bravely to play a part that was much more devious and heroic. They didn't do everything. Perhaps we could look at them and say, oh, they should have done this, or they should have done that. Or they contributed to the problem by misleading the Pharaoh. But perhaps doing more things would have gotten them killed, led to, to more people dying. We don't know. But they could not follow orders. And so they found this third path, this path in the middle, where they saved lives and they told some lies. And in the face of these overwhelming obstacles, they managed to make a tangible difference. And this kind of bravery is throughout our scriptures. The kind that sees the difference between the world we were enculturated into and the kingdom of God. And instead of putting our heads down, the brave way is to find a way to step toward the kingdom of God. And we see this in the Bible over and over again. I think about it also when I read Paul's letter to the Romans. Chapter 12 is this... Uh, uh, fairly commonly used passage in churches, so you may know it. It talks about the body of Christ. There's many members, but one body, and we all have a different role to play. He starts off this chapter uh, by talking about who we are. And he says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Now we hear these words a lot, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. And, and maybe sometimes when we know a scripture well, it just kind of goes in one ear and out the other. Maybe I'm the only one. Yeah. Um, but recently I read this scripture as, as rendered by J.B. Phillips, and it read like this, 
Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its own mold. But let God remold your minds from within. Remold your minds from within. And this is what Paul calls the church. The people who have heard of the kingdom of God and are willing to allow that kingdom to change their worldview and then to act on it doing our part as part of that worldview, that kingdom of God. See, the women in this story could have stayed in the mold that the society had tried to squeeze them into. They could have conformed. I'm just a midwife. What good is it to resist? I'm just a slave. What good is it to hide my son or to put him in a basket and send him down river? What hope is there in that? Or I'm just the Pharaoh's daughter, one of many daughters that he has, one of many girls. I do not matter. What difference could it make if I raise this one Hebrew child as my own. But you and I know different. Together, each of these people doing their small part, their important acts, refusing to conform their lives to the power of this world, even their own religious systems, together they chart a path a path that leads to Moses and leads to the emancipation of the slaves, the Israelites. You see, when we look at these big problems in the world, it seems impossible. We're up against ages old systems and structures. We've been programmed with these unconscious biases from childhood. We get tired of people bringing up things like this that we feel like we don't have control over. With the consequences of standing out can seem overwhelming, and we don't know how to find a clever way like the midwives. After all, we're only one person, right? But the Bible, the Bible keeps messing up our worldview, doesn't it? The Bible challenges that. It says over and over again that we are not alone. That playing our small part really matters. That we can make a difference and it isn't hopeless. We don't have to let the world squeeze the life out of us. Squeeze our faith out of us into its own mold, or leave us with our head in the sand just trying to get on day by day. We have another choice. We can let God remold our minds, remake our lives, so that we can be part of building the kingdom of God. How? Is it because we're better than other people? No. Paul says in, in Romans 12, he begins Romans 12 by saying, because of God's mercies, not just one mercy, but abundant mercies, thousands of mercies that he has poured out into our lives. Because of God's grace, he says in verse 3, we are overwhelmed by grace and mercies of God that allow us to break out of these molds, to confound history and precedent or statistics, and to chart a new path, a third path. Paul articulates what it looks like to be a follower of Christ. And it's not volunteer hours or worship attendance. It's a mind 
and heart and life that has been open to making the hard choices one day at a time, bravely doing what we can with what we have where we are. Not what we think we can, not what we feel like doing, because that would be nice, <laughs> but what God says is our part to play. We have the ability, because of God's grace, to make a difference. What is making your heart ache today? Who is your heart breaking for? Is it important enough to you, to God? to refuse to stand on the sidelines, to refuse the voices that say, I'm too old or too young or too sick or too dumb. Because, because Jesus called a crew together and it was a motley crew. And we continue that tradition. The church today is a motley crew. But it's through each of us coming together that something amazing happens. We become church. Not a building or a people or a place where we gather to worship or people who are nice to each other, but a force. This is what the church is. It's a force of hope in a world of hopelessness. A force of joy in a frightened world. A force of love in a hate-filled world. A force of faith that says yes. With God, it is possible. What is your heart breaking for? Who is your heart breaking for? I guarantee God's heart's breaking as well. Let's step forward. Let's find a way to enter into God's kingdom this day. As we lead into our response to God's word and a time of communion, I invite you to open your hearts in a time of confession as we pray to God to cleanse us and renew us. God of mercy and grace, it is hard to hold on to hope. We see people handed over as food for the enemy's teeth or as prey for the hunter's traps. Sometimes we are food and prey. Sometimes we are enemy and hunter. Sometimes we are merely bystanders, too afraid or powerless to act as we should. Forgive us, O oh God, when we accept things as they are. Maker of heaven and earth, giver of hope, savior of the distressed, fill our imaginations and our hearts with your splendid vision for our world. Transform and renew our minds, that we may discern what is good and pleasing to you in this world you love so deeply. Amen. Jesus promised that the gates of the underworld would not be able to stand against the church. Each of us is part of this church, this body of Christ. Each of us has unique gifts and our own unique calling. Know that through God's mercies, you are forgiven. Know that God will bless you with new imaginings, new thoughts, new hopes, and new courage that we too may stand against the gates of the underworld.
We don't take up an offering these days in the pews, but I remind you that on your way out, if you would like to give towards the ministry of this church, or if you'd like to give online, please do so. Thank you for your generosity. Paul writes that we belong to one another and are to serve one another with our gifts. This beautiful vision moves beyond the church through the one who draws the world together in love. We all belong to one another and depend upon one another. And our financial offerings help hold us together through the ministry of Clough United Methodist Church. So I invite us to give thoroughly of our presence and vision, our resources and efforts for the saving of our world.
Before we move on to communion, I do want to take a moment to bless the uh, those who are returning to learning. This week we did do the drive-through and drive and prayed over each building. But I know that in our midst we uh, represent a lot more than just our local our local schools. And so I'd like to enter into a time of prayer. And I will uh, open a time of silence, and I'll invite you to name um, schools, teachers, uh, families that are returning to learning this day. Any questions? Make sense? All right. Let us join together in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you that you have made us to be curious, to grow and learn, and to adapt. In this time of stress and difficulty and, and lots of adaptation, we lift up to you, your students and teachers and staff and schools that you have laid on our hearts and to around the world. Wilkes's and Kara's. Seven Hill School. Are with you, Elementary. For these and many more, we give you thanks, Father. Pour out your blessings upon them, that they may know your presence and your comfort and your protection this day. God, then throughout the year, that they may, may act with wisdom, with love, and with peace. Amen. Here at the communion table, we see most clearly that we are not alone that we are united as one in the body of Christ. We are no longer divided. The table is open to people of all ages, nations, and races, different ideas, different backgrounds, different gifts. Here, unique individuals become a single body, made richer for the multitude of gifts shared. Here we feast on one bread and one cup and become one body in service to this world. A body that is stronger and more powerful than we can ever imagine in the face of the problems of this day. This meal was instituted by Jesus himself. And in his last days, he gathered with his community, his ragtag disciple group. He lifted up the bread and the cup. He blessed them and shared them and said, take, eat, take, drink in remembrance of me. And so, Holy Spirit, pour out your presence upon us gathered here this day and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry with all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast transformed at his heavenly banquet table. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Will you join us in communion?
as you go forth. Resist the powers of this world that use people. Hear the cries of the weak. Dare to work for justice. Know that God, source, word, and spirit, is your help, will keep you safe, and will bring you new life. You are blessed by God and sent to serve. Amen.